Thank you. Super fun to be here with you all. First of all, Santa Cruz County has been my home for, I realize, almost 50 years. So welcome to Monterey Bay. This place rocks. It's um, paradise. And of course, a lot of us have worked very hard to make sure that it continues to be paradise as, uh, as best we can. So there is going to have the content part of this hour, and uh, I'm, I'm here about the inspiration and, and sort of reflections on how far we've gone and uh, what, we can, what we can do to keep things going forward. And really, of course, as we know here, um, and more and more we realize, it's going to be about global collaboration, because the ocean, you know, no one owns it, all countries touch it, and, um, and even though it's pretty daunting here in the U.S. for all of us that have slaved away in environmental policy all of these years. I'm here to say that I'm really excited and optimistic about what's happening on the global scale and also what we can do on the state and regional scale. So I had the huge privilege of growing up in California near the coast. Actually, I was over the hill, um, as the coastal dwellers call it. And of course, um, California is just an amazing treasure trove of natural riches, as we know, from the Sierras to the Woodlands. I mean, I, I love it all. You know, every piece of it is amazing. And when I um, came to school here at UC Santa Cruz, I discovered the ocean. You know, I, I don't have the same uh, story as my friend Sylvia Earle, where she got in the water at age three. Uh, my dad loved to do cattle ranching, you know, when he wasn't running his business. So we were inland. but. It's all connected, and um, once once I came to be here on the shores of the bay, of course, I fell in love with it. And it's really it, it is truly a privilege for us to live in such a such a remarkable and, and beautiful place. And of course, our beautiful place here in Monterey Bay, along the Central California coast, it's been the beneficiary of you know incredible amounts of work by many people here in the room, and it's safeguarded by a lot of protections today, but. Sadly, um, now more than ever, we realize those safeguards are imperiled. And of course, despite all the great work we've done, global climate change is, I like to, you know, I think of it like the mother of all conservation issues. You know, everything that we've worked so hard to do until now is threatened by what's happening to our climate. And of course, global climate change is an ocean story, and most people uh, beyond this room don't realize that's the case. Here in Monterey Bay, as you know, we really can celebrate the largest national sanctuary in the continental U.S. and an amazing network, really the nation's first network of fully protected um, and uh, partially protected, marine protected areas and then reserved in state waters. And that was a huge move. In California, we have the opportunity to do things that um, can't happen other places and therefore, you know, really provide an amazing model. But of course, beyond the shores here, uh, all was not well. And when we began the, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and of course the idea was to do this aquarium all about this amazing place, Monterey Bay, and the original aquarium was just about the near shore habitats of Monterey Bay. And then, as many of you may know, um, a few years into doing the aquarium after we opened, we realized we've got to broaden the story here because really, Monterey Bay, you know, no part of the ocean is isolated, and what's happening in the global ocean uh, needs to be part of our story, and we opened our outer bay wing, we now call it the open, open sea wing. It was a big challenge for our husband routine to figure out how to present the open sea and open sea animals, you know, in, in an exhibit environment. Still is a very interesting challenge, I have to say, but that's another, that would be another talk, um, keeping all those animals in there together. And uh, so, you know, you've heard from some great ocean champions during, during our time here together, and I, I'm hoping to kind of connect the dots a bit about what we can do, and especially with, with the climate change. Well, first of all, um, we can draw so much inspiration from what's happened here in Monterey Bay, you know, in the past century. I mean, I think, you know, as I said, at the, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, where I you know, was one of the founders way, way back in the day, uh, this day is what inspired the Monterey Bay Aquarium to exist. And our goal was uh, to be a different kind of aquarium, uh, not, not be about <coughs> fish and dolphins, uh, but be you know, sure with people what the ocean is really like. The founders, well, I studied 
marine algal ecology and other founders were invertebrates on all of this. So we are really about, okay, let's show an authentic view of the ocean and get people to realize, you know, how incredibly rich it is. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, the largest habitat on Earth, as, as we all know. And the Monterey Bay story and the success here is really central to the theme idea that people leave with after they leave the aquarium. And, and I bring this up just to reinforce, you know, one of my key themes, which is, you know, we need to demonstrate models of success wherever, wherever we are. I mean, change starts locally, and we have an incredible success story here, and, you know, we're creating success stories around the nation, around the globe, and we need to keep that going. Well, as far as Monterey Bay goes, you know, as we all probably know, a um, hundred years ago, things here were not so good. You know, many of the marine mammals were severely threatened in decline, some threatened with extinction. As you know, the sea otter population was now thought to be extinct, the elephant seals, we were a whaling center. Of course, we have like, the story of the sardine fishery, boom and bust. All of those stories um, were, you know, uh, an example of what happens when people have uncontrolled use of use of resources wherever they are, and remarkably now, thanks to actions that people took, all the all the environmental laws that were passed in the 70s, on the Endangered Species Act, and then before that, the Marine Animal Protection Act, all of those actions, the creation of the sanctuary here, all the wildlife here is on the rebound, and uh, people can come here. I mean, the fact that 39 million people live in the state and they can come to this piece of coastline and see animals like sea otters, you know, just right off the shore is really an incredible victory and something that we should never take for granted and we need to continue to work hard to protect, but also that we need to celebrate, you know, we can do it. So many of the endangered species that are up and down the coast, um, you know, are on the rebound. But still, of course, again, back to our theme of climate change, things are not well. Our team at the Aquarium just um, published a really interesting story about, uh, along with a number of collaborators, about the decline in kelp forest cover along our coast over the years. Many of you who have lived near here for a long time have probably have observed this. And um, it turns out that this has been a really big deal for the sea otter population, not surprisingly. Without the refuge provided by the kelp forest, um, the sea otters are more vulnerable to predator interactions. So we're seeing more uh, orphan pups and injured adults come into the aquarium with white shark bites. And um, you know, some people would say, well, the white sharks protected their they're on the increase, you know, sure sort of their relationships there, their prey is on the increase, but uh, <coughs> clearly um, the uh, the culprit would appear to be global ocean warming. I mean kelp forests are temperate species, they like cold water, and our oceans are warming right here. Only one of many things that's changing here in the bay and uh, that, that we absolutely need to take action on and, and uh, you know, work, work to turn around. Well, so, of course, at the broader scale, I'm sure Sylvia and others um, said in, in many eloquent ways what we all know to be the case, which is well, the ocean is really the heart of Earth's climate system. In the ocean, it's our lungs, it's our pantry, it's our playground. It drives global commerce with all of its um, aquatic highways. It's a treasure trove for innovation for the future to solve human scale problems. And of course, it's also a source of inspiration and joy. But most importantly, it drives world climate, as we all know. And the problem is we really have such an imperfect knowledge of what's going on in the ocean that the ocean piece of our global climate models is, I will just say, you know, sketchy. It's very, um, it, it, it's, it's probably the most important piece. I mean, we're, we're measuring the carbon inputs into our planetary system, but what happens to them once they get in the ocean is still um, very much needing to be studied. And of course, with our current uh, U.S. attitude about funding science, it's really, a, you know, that's a scary situation, and that's one of the reasons I'm really proud to, uh, proud my family decided to, my father decided to create Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is a privately funded research institute that's working on understanding 
the global um, system and impact of carbon inputs into the ocean because the ocean is uh, it's absolutely central to that story. So, um, you know, I grew up uh, in, in a business family and uh, I fled to UC Santa Cruz, the most like lefty campus I could think of back in 1969. And, um, but over the years, uh, as we kind of change and grow on our attitudes, you know, I've really come to realize that whether we like it or not, business is writing what goes on on the planet. And without working uh, with market strategies and working with business, we're not going to make any progress at all. So, you know, I, I really want to encourage everyone, and I know there are business representatives on the audience here, you know, to, to really work to push the market space solutions and work to push businesses that are involved with, you know, producing all the products that we're consuming, that we love to consume, and to do that in a more sustainable way. Well, I said that on the national scale in terms of policy, things are kind of grim, but what's filling that void instead is we're seeing some really important business commitments by businesses that do realize, you know, what's happening with global climate change is serious. It's a serious threat to the future of the businesses, and um, they, you know, want to take leadership, and the more we ask for that leadership, the more it will happen. Uh, a few of the examples, you know, that, that come to mind in terms of business leadership. Uh, obviously, um, you know, we have uh, Apple and others are finding ways to create a circular economy, which is a great idea, and there are few people are a lot ahead of us in that idea. I mean, Americans were pretty much the one way consumed to dispose uh, culture, but they're they're really working on leadership. Um, relying on, you know, reusing raw materials instead of using virgin new materials. Microsoft has made a big commitment around uh, kind of an internal carbon tax that uh, is just a, a forward, forward looking way of, of addressing that issue. And the um, city of San Jose has created a really ambitious goal about becoming a carbon neutral city. Monterey Bay Community Power, our region has put together a community power consortium so all of us can by green power, which is really cool, the economy is going to get in on that. And so um, all of these moves are things that are in, in the right direction. And when these businesses make commitments, you know, it's up to us to call them out, whether they're serious commitments or sort of just on paper commitments. But I do believe that, you know, this business leadership and showing that you can make money and operate in a more sustainable way, that's what's going to make the change. So we need to support all of that. Well, of course, the Aquarium's uh, Seafood Watch program is a fantastic um, example of that. That uh, really is just blown away all of our expectations about what a market space model could do, where you mobilize consumers and run asking for change, and in turn, you get business attention and they make the change. So, Seafood Watch, um, which hopefully everyone has their Seafood Watch app, Unless you're a vegan or vegetarian, in which case I applaud you. You know, it's great to not eat fish. I'm sure Sylvia told you to not eat fish. And I'm sorry, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, we're kind of working in the space of, hey, the US is the second largest consumer of seafood. We import 90% of it. You know, what if we change that demand to being something more sustainable? So we're working in the with business space. And it's really exciting to see the change. It began as a uh, consumer awareness program. But soon enough, the media buzz that was created by consumer questions and also by celebrity chefs that they enlisted to be to speak out around this uh, created enough media attention that it got business, you know, got business attention and business started to come to the table. Right now, there's literally a whole, I like to call it an ecosystem of NGOs working with these businesses on change. Some are more in the calling them out mode, like Greenpeace, who publishes a list of retailers and their seafood practices. It's like a report card. These big retailers, if they get a bad, you know, if they get a bad grade, they immediately call up Seafood Watch or one of the NGOs that's working on change that will partner with them and say, okay, if you do these things, if you get these products off your shelves, um, then uh, you'll come out better next year, and then you can count that with your customers. So all of that's driving some really exciting change, and now the, the question is to get it 
to work through the supply chain. Global Fishing Enterprise, I'm at SEV, has the most complicated supply chain of any commodity. Um, and there's just myriad <coughs> producers and you know, little people and et cetera. But um, increasingly, we're, we're seeing more and more things that get Marine Stewardship Council certified, which is a third party eco label, as you may know. And, um, and we have a new aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture standard that um, not only is in place for aquaculture, you know, sustainable aquaculture, but also um, our Seeker Watch team is advising entire governments on creating sustainable aquaculture standards, um, for example, in places like um, Thailand, where uh, shrimp farming is a, a huge piece of their, you know, global economy, and yet it's providing, you know, terrible degradation of the coastal mangrove forests, which in turn are not only productive for fisheries, but also protect them from um, the increasing storm damage that's happening, again, with global climate change. Well, so that's on the market-based uh, change that business can, can lead, and really, as consumers, we're, we're in the driver's seat there, and we need to continue to, to, you know, to demand change, and you know, bit by bit, businesses are going to respond, and they already are. The other thing, though, that I'm, that I'm really enthused about is, despite uh, the United States' lack of leadership, there's tremendous momentum going on on the global scale. It's, I mean, and you probably, those of you who followed the whole, um, you know, global Paris Agreement and, you know, that whole scenario, you'll know that, that everyone else say, hey, U.S., we're going on without you, you know, good luck with your, with your position on that. And the exciting thing to me is that more and more, along with continued progress on global climate commitments, the ocean is finally becoming a part of the conversation. So you may know about the sustainable development goals that are goals for sustainability from the global community set by the UN, um, or set in the UN setting. Um, in the last update, for the first time, there is a sustainable development goal for water, for the ocean. I mean, you'd think that they would not have forgotten the ocean when developing goals for sustainability, but guess what? They did until just a couple years ago. So this is a huge opportunity because it means that in these global arenas, you know, the ocean's being talked about. And the thing that I like that um, that's really, really cool, and I'm hoping, you know, the conversation will go in this direction. If you look at all the other sustainable development goals, on this chart, and sorry, you maybe can't see it, you can find it online, but healthy ocean really connects to practically every box on there, to poverty, to, you know, um, it's uh, between my glasses, and I can't remember the other ones, but you got the grip. Um, all the human, the sustainable development goals are really about bringing the world out of poverty, you know, education, and uh, you know, a sustainable future for everyone. And uh, when you look at the ocean up there with all the other ones, you realize, hey, people wake up. The ocean connects to all of these other goals in a huge way. Um, whether it's uh, <coughs> fair labor practices, I'm a number of women that are in the seafood enterprise, they might not be out fishing on fishing boats. They're the ones that are picking the crab out of the you know, crab claws and that are, you know, peeling the shrimp that you buy at Trader Joe's, which, by the way, I hope you quit buying that shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, back to the local scale, then. Along with this global progress, we are going to have um, continued great leadership here in California. We all know we live in a bubble. We've got you know, a democratic constituency, we have people who care about the environment. Our voters have voted for the biggest um, park and water and land conservation bonds in the history of the U.S. by far, many times over. And by the way, there's another one on the ballot in June, uh, Parks and Water Bond, vote for it. It's going to be super exciting and it's going to provide a lot of opportunity for coastal protection and restoration and access and, and a lot of other good stuff that we all care about. So in terms of California, obviously, um, so many things that we can say about it. We obviously have had 
uh, a huge, huge leadership in terms of setting our carbon emission, uh, a carbon emission caps and working to meet those goals. Uh, we've been part of a whole West Coast governor's collaboration, the entire West Coast, to set goals together and also to think about how we can manage our ocean. Um, not thinking about the, the, the uh, political lines on the map between our states, but thinking about the fact that we're all part of the California current ecosystem. Oops, sorry. My timer just, that was better than one minute. I thought it had to be me. Um, and so, uh, anyway, stay engaged in what's happening here in California. The governor's having a huge, huge climate conference in the fall. You've probably known about it. Global leaders are going to come from all over the world to come talk about climate and what we're all going to do about it. So, in closing, uh, leave us with this thought. Um, individually, we're one drop. Together, we are an ocean. And uh, I just want to thank everyone in the audience for all you're doing uh, on behalf of the future of the ocean. We got to keep it up. We got to keep going. We got to do more. And um, just uh, encourage all of you to link in with whatever advocacy group that is your favorite one to to work on change. Um, give money to people, to get the right people in Congress. I'm sorry, that's not wearing my Monterey Bay Aquarium Director hat. That's me talking about the most important thing I'm doing right now. Um, again, California, we're set. It's uh, what's happening around the rest of the country, whether we're not. So thanks for all you do, and I um, appreciate the invitation here. Thank you.